Welcome. Yeah. Okay, welcome to the last lecture of the semester. It's been, yeah, all right. It's been an incredibly long semester. It's been four months. We find ourselves here today on the precipice of the final exam. Um, today is a very busy day. We got a lot of stuff we gotta get through. It's gonna be the busiest day of the entire semester. So as you know, the exam is Thursday. There's a study sheet that's been up online uh, since Saturday. For that, for that, I sent out a vSpace announcement about it after it went up. In addition, we will have a review session today. The faster I can get through these first two uh, mini lectures, the more time we'll have for the review session. And we also have paper copies of the review sheet to pass out in advance of that review session. Any questions about organizational stuff? So today what we're going to do is we're going to do a lecture on Carpe Diem and its enemies, and then we're going to do a mini lecture on final thoughts about the semester, recapping some of the things we learned this semester, uh, and, then, and then we'll move on. Uh, so, oh, and one other organizational thing before we get started, uh, the readers, and, and also I have been reading your Pennebaker introspective essay exercises. We promised you that these will be read, and indeed they are being read. And uh, I don't know, I just wanted to say that, you know, they're, they're very intense, they're very, you know, the Pennebaker essay exercise, I think it went well. Uh, I don't know, I, I guess I, I'm actually a little bit embarrassed by the things that I wrote about when I did the essay exercise, because they kind of pale in comparison and gravity and seriousness to yours. Uh, and I guess I forgot that, I mean, you're not all like 20 to 22 years old, but many of you are. Um, I forgot about how, you know, at that age, there's a lot of really serious stuff out in people's lives. You know, like parents are, are maybe being sick, grandparents are maybe passing away, uh, people, you know, you're wrestling with college, a lot of people trying to hold down a job, you're at college, a lot of people have kids, or, or trying to have kids, trying not to have kids, you know, uh, people. <laughs> Dealing with relationships, and you're kind of just getting started on the whole heavy, deep relationship thing, you know, which is very heavy and deep when you really starting, and you're like, whoa, this is weird. And either you or your partner may be struggling with that. And anyway, I, I don't know, I, just, I was just reminded of all that, and just as we read them, you know, we take them seriously and you have our respect, so your, your essays wound up in a good place, uh, whatever that means. So, um, oh, and, and also, uh, people, a lot of people wrote about some very serious, grave stuff. We put up a list of like various resources for positive mental health and well being and counseling, uh, phone numbers for that. I'm not pointing any fingers at any of you, uh, but there's no shame in going to counseling, uh, it's something that, that people generally benefit from. So, uh, we put up a bunch of numbers, one of the readers uh, put together a list of stuff, and it's posted on BSpace, so go check that out if you are so inclined. Um, Today, we're going to talk about carpe diem and a bunch of social psychology research relating to carpe diem. Uh, what, what, what does carpe diem mean? See today, in what language? Exactly. Do any of you learn Latin still? Anybody still learn Latin? Three of you. Okay, all right. And the rest of you are mumbling, what is Latin? What is <laughs> okay, so a lot of social psychology, I don't know Latin either, so don't feel anything. Uh, a lot of social psychology research converges on relevance to this concept of season today, carpe diem. And probably, this is my favorite research in social psychology because a lot of it talks about how the, the things that hold you back from really doing the things that would make you happy uh, in life are. Um, are illusions, there's illusions. So enemy number one of carpe diem in social psychology research is self-consciousness. And I'm gonna introduce some research today that suggests that self-consciousness is primarily a product of various perceptual and judgmental illusions. For example, the spotlight effect, the illusion of transparency, and it tends to expect excessively harsh criticisms from other people for one's missteps and foibles. And I'm gonna try and kind of go through these pretty quickly so we can wrap this, wrap this one up in like 20 minutes. You know, we don't want to talk about season of the day forever, right? I mean, you know, that was 10 points. Okay, so uh, the illusion of transparency. By the way, whenever I have these concepts and they have definitions tied to them, you know that there's a high probability they might wind up on the test. This is an example of that. So the illusion of transparency is the tendency for people to overestimate how much other people can see their internal states. And this is one form of self-consciousness, right? This is something that I don't know if you experience this, but as I walk around my everyday life, I kind of get the sense that people know what I'm thinking, or if I have fears or concerns or things that haunt me, I feel like somehow people know about it, you know? Or if you feel awkward or nervous in some social setting, then maybe maybe everybody knows. And everybody's kind of studying you and saying, oh yeah, yeah, you look really nervous. And that's that's, that's my everyday life. Just looking around at people thinking they're thinking I'm, I'm real nervous. Um, so Gilovich, Tom Gilovich, who's a social psychologist at Cornell University, decided to do uh, some research on this tendency, the illusion of transparency. And what he did, he did a bunch of studies on this in this paper that came out in but one of the studies, I thought, did a good job of just exemplifying this, this illusion really well. He had participants, he got a bunch of participants together, like three or four at a time or something, had to sit around a table, and then had them play a truth or lie telling game, where they would make up a list of like four truths and one lie. It's like a truth or dareish kind of setting, um, more interesting than your average lab experiment. And uh, so it was rigged so that they told lies 20% of the time. They were told, you know, you know, one in five of your statements would be a lie about yourself, and then four of them, four out of five, to be true. And then they had people that sat at the table, you know, hear these statements, and then try to guess which ones are lies and which ones are truths. Uh, you know, so it's really a truth or dare type situation. Pretty fun game to play. So people were. Decently good, you know, well, they weren't very good. They weren't very good at guessing, but people were lying or not. People were lying 20% of the time, people only guessed it right about 26% of the time. So people, people's ability to guess which one of your five statements was a lie was only marginally better than chance, say 6% better. But when they asked the people, what do you think is going to be the rate at which people will guess which statements are true or lie? People who told these you know, lies and truths guessed that they would be detected 49% of the time. So they thought that people could see through them, see into their internal state, and see what they were really thinking at a pretty high rate, much, much higher rate than was actually the case. And Gilligan colleagues go on to try to explain, you know, why is it? Why is it that we think that our, you know, our minds and our hearts are wide open to the people around us and they can see right through us? Why, why do we think this? And they came to the conclusion, and they have good research supporting this, that what happens is a dynamic of anchor and adjustment. You tend to anchor on your own self-knowledge about, say, which one of these statements is a lie or, or a truth, or your self-knowledge that you're nervous in some social setting, for example, and then you insufficiently adjust to take into account other people's perspective. So we talked about this before, anchor and adjustment models of cognition, you have some kind of first thought you anchor on, and then you take into account other information and adjust, and, and you end up getting a more accurate or realistic answer, or seeing things more accurately or realistically, but you tend to not adjust them enough, and it also tends to be effortful. And so the conclusion is, you know, if you're tired and you're low in effort, you know, uh, psychological resources, then you might do this effect even more. Uh, but this is the reason that people tend to think that people can see through them and can detect things about themselves that they can't really detect. It's because they think, you know, I know this about myself, they, they must also. Any questions about this? Yes. So they did, they were total strangers, they were students like in a psychology class, you know, not in like, like this setting, uh, who just kind of thrown into a room together. But uh, it's a good question, like, would it be anticipated? Would people actually be able to see through you more if, uh, if they were friendly or they you? I bet they would, and I bet, indeed, this 26% number would go up, right? But I also bet that this one would go up as well. You know, your guess of how well they know you might go up. And who knows, maybe this one would go up even more, you know, than the 26%. And uh, it's another research question, and a good one. Okay, so that's one enemy of carpe diem. We are excessively, uh, we believe ourselves to be transparent to others, and we think people can see our motivations and our emotions more than is actually the case. Okay, here's another one. This is a very related concept, but it's not actually exactly the same thing. A lot of people think this is the
Now, there's a strong tendency to overestimate how much other people are looking at us. We, people are not looking at us all the time. Gilbert and colleagues did some great research on this in 2000. And the, okay, so I love these studies they did. In the first study, they had like four or five people go into a room, a lot like the, tr the, the lies you're telling study, four or five people from a class like this go into a room, and on their way in, they stop one of them and they say, hey, hey, uh, really quick, do you mind putting on this very yellow t shirt? We're just going to put on this very yellow t shirt. On. And uh, for some reason, and you would offer some great insight on this, they all said, okay, sure, I'll do that. Um, I, I don't know why you would agree to do that, but literally everyone agreed to the very yellow t shirt. So they put the very yellow t shirt, they're really embarrassed, because the very yellow is a very embarrassing sort of lounge singer character in the 70s, who most of your, your parents, your, your mother crashed in love with, I don't know, um, or your father's whatever. Um, and they're wearing the very yellow t shirt, and they're in this group discussion, and then they survey people everybody afterwards, you know, what t shirts were people wearing, and did you, know, did you see what was on participant five's, you know, t shirt. And as it turns out, a pretty low percentage of people notice that it's a very yellow t shirt, the guys wearing the very yellow t shirt for the woman. Uh, but people think everybody noticed, right? They're like, oh my god, I'm so sure that everyone thought you were incredibly embarrassing, very yellow t shirt. And they radically overestimate the extent which people did notice. They overestimate how much people were watching them and picking up on these, these little characteristics about our self presentation. So then they were like, so this was clearly like Tom Gillis' idea to make everybody, Tom's, you know, like middle aged guy, very yellow is the like prototypical embarrassing singer from his generation to root for, you know, to, to wear a t shirt for, to be a fan of. Uh, and then his graduate students were like, no, 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 you know, it may just be people who really know very yellow is, you know, uh, these, these kids they don't know about very yellow anymore, which is, you know, just as well. Um, and so they ran the second study, a replication, where they had a uh, vanilla ice t-shirt. I've seen this t-shirt, because I want to point out it's ridiculous. It was like, for one, it's gratuitously oversized. It was like a double extra large. And then uh, it had these giant yellow letterings that said ice, ice, baby, uh, <laughs> vertically. And then it was like dripping or something. It was some kind of, it was like a yellow dripping. It didn't look good. It didn't look good. Um, so of course, everybody goes, oh my god, everybody's going to notice I'm wearing this incredibly embarrassing vanilla ice t-shirt. Uh, and, and, and then people really don't notice. It's very high rate. 10, 20% of people notice or something. But people radically overestimate the extent of this effect. And again, they explain this with an anchoring and gut explanation, right? They say, look, you know what you're wearing, so you anchor on that. But everybody must know what I know. And then you go, oh, wait, they have a different perspective. Maybe they don't know everything I know. Oh, maybe they didn't even notice. Maybe they're looking at everybody else's t-shirts, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And you, but you insufficiently adjust for other people's perspective. So you anchor on your own perception of yourself and then take into account other people's. And anchoring adjustment is especially bad for like emotionally valence, uh, strong emotional sentiments like great embarrassment. If you say, wow, I think you have this t-shirt and boy is embarrassing, that'll be this very strong anchor, which your brain will very effortlessly pull towards a more realistic impression of the situation and how much people are actually watching you. Uh, do you understand this anchor adjustment concept? Any questions? Okay. Yes. I don't, they didn't measure this. I don't remember if they measured the amount of embarrassment, but they, uh, they, they reasoned that anchor adjustment was stronger, a stronger effect here because of this high emotional balance of the anchor. But the way they did the data analysis was they just asked you how many people do you think noticed you know, what t shirt you had on, and then they asked everybody how many of you noticed what t shirt the person had on. And that's one of the nice things about these studies is they reveal these very fundamental observations of everyday life. People can't see your internal states, they're not watching you all the time. But they're really simple. The design of the studies are really, really simple. Uh, they're just us misperceiving how much of how other people see us. Okay. This one's really good. I like this one a lot. Uh, this is a very, very related idea. Expectations of overly harsh criticism. We tend to overestimate how harshly other people judge us for our blunders, mishaps, and failures. We tend to think that if we do something silly in public, everybody's going to notice, and everybody, you know, spotlight effect, and then everybody's going to judge us very harshly. And then Gilovich, in some research with uh, Ken Savitsky in 2001, decided to systematically uh, study this effect. And basically, what he did was set up a bunch of situations where people would have to essentially embarrass themselves in front of other people, and then estimate how harshly these people judge you, and then how harshly do you think they're going to judge you. Exact same design, right? Exact same design as the truth lie telling game, or the spotlight effect game, uh, or, or experiment, or whatever. Uh, so, my favorite one of these studies was study four. In study four, um, they're doing an introduction study where you're asked a bunch of questions and they're, you're told you're on a computer interface and you're told it's networked with like three or four other people and, and it actually is networked with like three or four other people. And they ask you a ton of questions very personal, like 50 or 60 questions or something. And uh, what they tell you is that there's going to be a computer generated introduction of you to the other people that are participating in the study based on your answers to the questions. So you answer all these questions, and you're like, okay, all right, they're going to make some introduction uh, of me to these other people. And they sneak in there a question that's like, have you ever at any point in your life left a bed? Give me that. Give me a question back. For fun. Just for shit. And um, no, they didn't ask you that. But anyway, so, uh, so they sneak that question, and you're about that. And then you're like, oh, no, I'm not ready. Maybe I'm okay. Maybe I should. Okay. Maybe I want some quests. And then the resulting computerized introduction goes out to all of the participants in the study. And it says, although participant A is not without faults, occasionally having some difficulties with bedwetting, uh, she or he has continued to excel as a student at Cornell and considers him or herself to be a friendly, outgoing, and caring person. So you can imagine your reaction if this introduction went out with you, right? You'd be like, this is not. You'd be getting up and you know, contacting the experimenter. You'd be like, this is ridiculous. I, I met when I was a little child. I don't struggle with bedwetting anymore, you know? Um, and uh, people, people uh, got very worked out in the study. They were very, very upset uh, for, for very obvious reasons. I would be very upset as well. And, then they study, you know, uh, they have people rate, you know, their impressions of these people and rate them on what it takes, how much you respect the person, how much you like them, you know, how sympathetic a person is this. And they actually have these people who got the introduction rate you, even though you got this false introduction. And, and they don't rate you down that much. They kind of say, oh, you know, he or she has problems with bedwetting, you know, this worries things in the world. Um, but then, of course, the participants in the study themselves tend to way overestimate how harshly they get evaluated by these other people. They're like, oh, these people probably think I'm, I'm, a, I'm a total jerk, and, uh, you know, they're probably making fun of me in their cubicles right now. And, and they weren't really. People were actually more compassionate than that. So people tend to overestimate how harshly they were judged um, for this bedwetting. Okay, and then they want to identify what's the mechanism here, and it's Tom Gillich, they always think of this kind of cognitive heuristic mechanism that drives these sorts of effects in everyday life. And so uh, they found in their research that it was focalism, that you tend to just focus on that mishap, you tend to focus on the bedwetting information, and you don't pay any attention if you're the subject in the study, you want to be introduced to the bedwetter, you forget about all these other, this is, an extra, this is just an excerpt from the introduction, there's other stuff in the introduction as well. And there's like 10 bits of information about yourself in the full introduction, you know, you're friendly, you're outgoing, you're caring, but then there's also some stuff that indicates you're probably modest as well. So, you know, like you're introduced to somebody with like 10 good traits, and then one, you're a bedwetter, you know? And what do you do? You think, oh my god, they're going to just judge me on this, on this bedwetting thing, I've been found out, and, uh, and in actuality, people read, you know, the parents of the things, and they, they attach something to this to the Yes? Right, that's a good question. Like, I don't remember whether, I think everybody answered the same survey, but it would be interesting. I don't know if everybody answered the same survey, but maybe, yeah, maybe they were
what they find in this research is that immediately after an event, uh, an action or an inaction, some decision you make to behave or not behave, uh, you tend to regret your actions more than your inactions. You know, you do something, it goes wrong, it's embarrassing, you struggle with that, you know, it's frustrating, you know, whatever. Uh, you tend to not regret your inactions so much at that time, right? Because you're kind of doing gazillions and gazillions of inactions all the time. So right after you don't do something, it's already have a lot of regrets for that because you're going to continue not doing it in the next minute, next minute, next minute. So it just doesn't have the sale. So in that moment where you can feel regret for inactions. However, longer term, people tend to regret the things that they didn't do, not the things that they did. Uh, so you know, when you, when you look back at your life, you're going to regret you know not going on that vacation and instead you know buying that piece of furniture or, or not kissing that boy or that girl or something. Uh, you know, not applying for that job or applying for that graduate school. That's what you're going to regret. The things you didn't do, not the things you did that went badly. Now, there's a lot of reasons why this, this might be the case, and one of them is the affect of the immune system, which we talked about in the immune neglect uh, lecture just a couple lectures ago. And in the immune neglect lecture, we found that people are pretty good at getting over things when they get a story or narrative or understand them. You're pretty good at uh, returning to your kind of set point of happiness or unhappiness. And so the immune system works really well with stuff that's happened, uh, that they do it badly, but you can understand it, right? You can, you can wrap some kind of thing around it and get back to your base level of happiness. It doesn't work very well with things that didn't even happen, right? How are you supposed to get over an inaction? An inaction generates counterfactuals, counterfactuals, fancy psychology words for what ifs. You know, what if I had, you know, kissed that girl, or what if I had gone on that vacation, or what if I had applied to and gotten into that graduate school? And then your life would have gone this whole other way, you'll never even know about, you know? And you might, you know, you'll, you'll regret it, you can't get over it because you don't even know uh, what would have gone down, down that path. So it's harder to get over the things that you never do. Um, so if you, find, if you do something that winds up bad, you get over it surprisingly well, but you can't get over things that you don't do. So when it comes to the end, you're going to regret the things you didn't do, not the things you did. So all things being equal, you should err on the side of action. And you can do things and not, not do things. Okay. Some other research is relevant here uh, by, by this joker. So uh, <laughs> when, I, when I was in graduate school, I got interested in doing research on the relationship between success and failure. Uh, and I had this idea that people tend to fear failure excessively. And their fear of failure stops them from trying, and ironically, that, that stops them from succeeding. And that maybe the reason people do this is because they have a false theory in their heads that winning and losing are negatively related. Now, what does that mean, negatively related? Well, it's a statistical term for uh, two things that vary you know, in, in, uh, in negative relationship. I just used the word in the definition. I just did that. Okay. Uh, that when one goes up, the other goes down, the other goes down, the other goes up. People tend to think the more you win, the less you lose. And the less you win, the more you lose. They think in terms of winning percentage or batting average. We tend to think uh, you know, the people who are more successful, well, they never fail. They fail less. And the people who are less successful, they fail all the time. And so when people start failing, they go, oh, I'm one of those failing kind of people. I need to stop trying because all this failing is getting me down. But in many domains, uh, those who lose the most are also people who win the most. And I did a bunch of research showing or finding that uh, this is true for like college applications. We tend to think that the people who got into most schools get rejected by very few. Actually, the people who get into most schools for undergrad or for grad school are people who applied the most. They're the ones that uh, also got rejected by the most schools. And if you do so, you'll find the people who got accepted by six schools, they got rejected by six schools as well. They didn't get rejected by zero schools. It tends to be the case. Uh, and oh, I was one of those people. I, I only applied in undergrad to like two schools, got accepted by one, got rejected by one. What if I applied to six schools? You know, or you know, twelve. Maybe I would have more options. I would have more choices, and it would have been maybe more successful. It's also the case for paper submissions uh, to journals and uh, scholarship applications and things like that. Anything where opportunity is in your hand, where you can control how much you try, how hard you try, uh, that means that winning and losing are probably going to be positively related. As one goes up, the other goes up as well. So the takeaway from this is that you have to lose to win, and the real determinant of winning is how much you try. And you're not going to be able to win, you're not going to be able to succeed unless you develop tough, thick skin about losing, about failure and rejection. Until you tough it up about that, you're not going to be able to try enough to succeed as much as, as you should. And so the weird takeaway in this research is that losing is a symptom of trying, and trying is how you succeed. And so in a weird way, losing is a symptom of winning. Because if you're gonna win a lot, you're gonna have to lose a lot as well. And that's how you should digest and understand your failures and your losses is, oh yeah, I forgot, this is just something that happened along with the wins and the successes and the victories. The thing you should be most scared about is never failing, because it's probably not you ever tried, it probably means you won't succeed. Does this make sense? It's a strange idea, but uh, I think it's true. And I was just fussing around last night uh, watching the Lakers game, and then I, I decided to look this up. The top four people in this field goal attempts this year in the NBA, people who missed the most shots in the NBA, were, you know, not exactly the worst players in the NBA, right? They're like Kobe Bryant, Dwayne Wade, Dirk Nowitzki, doesn't get much respect, and deserves more. Uh, <laughs> FU, Jeff, more. Uh, LeBron. Um, so these are, these are pretty decent players, right? They also happen to be the top four scorers in the NBA. So what does this tell you? you know, if you want to succeed, if you want to score, then you need to you know, you have to take a lot of shot attempts. And, and these, let's see, LeBron was number one MVP voting, uh, Kobe was number two, and Dwayne Wade was number three. Dwayne Wade was number two. Not good. Okay. So some conclusions. So for a variety of reasons, you should do the things that you want to do and not let self-consciousness hold you back. There's a bunch of takeaways from these individual studies we just talked about. People can't see what you're really thinking. Your fears, your nervousness, your concerns, the things that haunt you, and so on. People can't see them, and so you need not assume in social settings that they can. Also, people are not watching you that closely. You know, you think about, maybe I should you know, cut loose and dance like a pretty moron. This yeah, you should do that. You should do that. And you're gonna get, oh, I'm gonna get noticed. I'm gonna be judging me. They're gonna think I'm an, I'm an idiot. Uh, but they're not. They're not watching you that closely. They're not gonna notice, and they're certainly not gonna remember tomorrow. Um, for a variety of reasons. But. <laughs> But also, even if people were watching you that closely, they simply won't judge you that harshly for your missteps, your mistakes, your foibles. I mean, you may think there's certain things mistakes or missteps that they don't even think are mistakes. They don't even assign that kind of uh, you know, signature to it. They just don't see it that way. Um, and then furthermore, another reason you need to go out and try is that you're more likely to regret not doing the things that you want to do than doing them and having something not go exactly the way you want it to. At the end of the day, you're going to regret your inactions, not your actions. You should side on the uh, side of action. And... Oh, uh, and then furthermore, people uh, who fail more also succeed more. So even if you go out and try and you find yourself failing, you should actually consider that as a sign of future success or past success because people who fail more, people who try more, and people who try more succeed more. So in life, really, the thing you need to fear is your regrets. Regrets for the things you didn't do, the times you didn't try. That's what you need to be worried about, not failure. Failure is a symptom of winning. Regrets, now that's something, that's something that should bother you. Okay, so to wrap up the Carpe Diem thing, some Carpe Diem related quotes. I love Carpe Diem related quotes. Here's one uh, from the Bible, Ecclesiastes. A man hath no better thing under the sun than to eat and to drink and to be merry, for that shall abide with him of his labor the days of his life, which God giveth him under the sun. This is often condensed to a shorter quote. Anybody Right, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. Which is a funny thing to find in the Bible, right? Cool. Okay. Um, and then Dylan Thomas, uh, a great, great prophet of Carpe Diem, he said, among other things, wait in the sun till the sun breaks down. Uh, he also has a great poem, Do Not Go Gentle Into That Good Night, which is essentially about uh, fighting, f